I'll just introduce everybody on the panel, as well as obviously the team from One Plus One. Um, we have uh, Kerry Ann Mendoza, uh, <laughs> she's an activist, occupier, and blogger at ScriptsNightDaily.org. She's been blogging about her experiences at the Occupy Finsbury Square site and was recently arrested for peacefully protesting outside Parliament. We have Daniele Rugo, who is a writer and filmmaker, as Daniela, there you are, um, writer and uh, filmmaker based in London and teaches a moving image at Goldsmiths. He's a founder member of INC, so INC, yeah. INC, yeah, Goldsmiths Continental Philosophy Research Group. Alex Williams is a theorist currently working on a PhD at UEL. He's currently uh, also working on a book entitled Folk Politics, The Deconstruction of Political Common Sense. Abby Weaver is, hello Abby, um, is a young film and theatre maker currently working on her first feature documentary, the co-founder of Breakfast Cinema Limited and a postgraduate student at the Central School of Speech and Drama. And Kay and Skye are here um, from uh, Noisy Image, which is a visual arts organisation which focuses on LGBT and human rights issues. So um, I thought I'd start the debate by um, my first question to Kerry. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, the Occupy movement and um, obviously this debate is about revolution. So I'd like you to maybe tell me a little bit about what is it about the Occupy movement that you see as particularly revolutionary that may be different to what has happened before. Um, and I know one of the things, uh, one of the criticisms of the Occupy movement is that it hasn't actually had any concrete or understandable aims, you know, like particular laws, particular bills yeah. that they want. So, is it that that also makes it revolutionary, that it doesn't, it doesn't want to work within the system itself, perhaps? Um, yeah, I preface any of my comments with I'm not speaking for the Occupy movement. I'm a person who's part of the Occupy movement and my, my views are my own. Um, what I find revolutionary about the Occupy movement, which is, 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 is that very thing, is that it doesn't seek change. Um, it doesn't seek... Um, and nobody I've met there seeks to kind of tinker with um, the existing activities that we have. There's, there's sort of a, a common perception that actually m the majority, if not all of, the institutions that we would go to in order to seek those changes are actually not there to serve us in the first place. So, um, so even, even taking a demand um, to them to some degree is an acceptance of their authority and what the movement is actually saying is we actually reject um, your authority, we reject your premise um, about who we are as people and our value um, being based on some contribution to some financial system um, we, we reject that entirely and we're actually, what I found most revolutionary about it is this incredible thing that's happening in you know a thousand cities all over the world with people just going i'm going to go out there and get to know some people i'm going to create a community where we're told one doesn't exist we're sort of told like there are all of these separations and there's all of this animosity between people and we really need all of these kind of laws and systems in place otherwise we'd be running around killing each other and yet when you get a couple of hundred people and stick them in a cap actually we're able to create these micro societies that function with this horizontal democracy based on personal responsibility. <coughs> and I've, I find it almost almost funny that that's a revolutionary idea, is that actually people people are actually able to create their own communities and structure um, and and create rules that work for, the, for their society. It's sad, a little bit sad, that that's a revolutionary idea, but that's how far we've come, I think, in the kind of neoliberal, there's no such thing as society construct, which is the context we live in our, we live our lives in at the moment. Okay. Um, Alex, I know that you've written, I was reading your blog uh, the other day, and you, you used the term, um, the dysphoria of the left, and this was about a year ago. Yeah, so. I mean, this was something which I was, I was thinking about a while ago, when, kind of before um, the sort of current round of uh, activism really kicked off, sort of even even before sort of the um, sort of activity in the Arab world as well, um, when there was a sort of real sense of sort of uh, dissipation, uh, which has now thankfully been been lost, I think, productively, mm. productively. So, I mean, I guess I guess the question which I'm most interested in. Um, with Occupy, really, it's just about the question of how how to move from uh, a sort of state of, of having these kind of flourishing um, 
sort of encampments, but moving beyond that to a point of not necessarily defining um, in concrete terms, but I think it is definitely a strength not to make demands of the system. And this was something which was always, um, which I was always very frustrated about, sort of in previous uh, sort of one day actions which you used to have sort of yeah. in the last 10 years when there was this kind of weird confusion between um, some sort of anti capitalist, um, anti authoritarian revolution content and uh, a kind of uh, still this idea that you're appealing to the authority, you're appealing to them to um, basically grant what you want, although often um, there was nobody that could actually grant what you want. So there was this weird kind of Layer, layering of stuff didn't, didn't quite make sense. I think, so I think the idea that um, you know to, to, to not make demands immediately is quite it's quite a strong one, um, and that obviously I shouldn't be drawn on, drawn on that. But I, mean, I guess the question is how to move from the current situation of having these thriving encampments towards um, closer to to something which does fulfil your vision. I mean, is there any I any sense of that? If, if I could come back on that, if anyone wants to jump in. Um, one of the things I'm finding most exciting at the moment is, um, in essence, it's a natural evolution. If you look at the cats themselves, the, the principal act is that you're reclaiming a public space or a private space for public use to create a space in which you can live and have a dialogue with other people. But it's cold. <laughs> it's very cold. Um, and it's hard to function and people can't wash properly, so it's uncomfortable. And so a natural evolution of that is now that and this is not just happening in London, this is happening all the world, they're going, hang on a minute, there are all of these empty buildings that aren't being used for any good purpose whatsoever. And meanwhile, we're closing down new centres, we're, you know, we're closing down community centres. Let's take back these buildings. And so just by Finsbury Square in London, you've got the Bank of Ideas, which is a reappropriated UBS building, which is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's got a 500 seat lecture theatre in it, it's got an undergrowth cart, we've got all this stuff. And um, we just took it back, basically, and said we're going to have that, um, and opened it up to local youth groups, community centres, basically people in the area who'd had their facilities taken away from them in the recent financial crisis, and said, come on, you know, use this space, and we've got lecturers coming in from Goldsmiths, SOAS, University of Sussex, and that's happening here, there's just around the corner there's a Bloomsbury Social Centre, which is a SOAS building, which has been occupied, and they're doing the same, they've just got another place over on, um, what's it, um, Ellis Street or something, it's basically next to the Bank of Ideas. Cardiff has done the same, Bristol is looking at buildings, and it's also happening in the States, they've got a Wells Fargo building in Nashville and various other places. So in terms of where it's going to go directly next, that's clearly the direction it's taken it, it's, it's going, okay, let's, We've, re we've reappropriated some kind of space. What other kind of space can we reappropriate? And I think whatever happens next will come out of that, that phase once people have a chance to talk more. But I think that the critical thing is that people are very much looking at this is, I mean, that question is, about where is this going? And, and I think people in the Occupy movement are asking themselves that every day. But instead of just asking it, they're going, I've got a suggestion. Mm. And then they're putting it as a proposal to a general assembly, which is a you know, direct form of democracy. And we're agreeing it as consensus, and then it's moving forward. And I think that's so powerful in a system where kind of representative, representative democracy has kind of failed in terms of actually attaining any of the real um, aims of the population that it purports to represent. So, yes, that would be one way in which I think it's going to move forward. Okay, you've you made a film at um, London Stock Exchange, you, which we'll be seeing later. Mm -hmm. so you, you interviewed a lot of people mm -hmm. at the camp. What was it? Your, what did you take away from that when you were well, filming there? I think it's really, it's really interesting what you're saying about the community there. That they're not being, in a sense, one kind of idea that people are latched onto and trying to fight for. Because um, as I was interviewing people, what was occurring again and again and again? is that people weren't really talking about politics in the kind of normal sense. They were talking about awakening, mm -hmm. the awakening of consciousness, mm -hmm. and uh, people being asleep, and that we need to, you know, we need to wake up and realize that people are in a state of sleep. And, and, and I was thinking, for all these are very spiritual ideas. They're all ideas that you find in Buddhism, and you know, esoteric Christianity, Sufism, all these ideas of awakening of consciousness. And I just, I, 
for me, I just found that very, very interesting that that was what was what was being spoken about generally, rather than a political kind of you know. What, I mean, maybe I could ask the rest of the panel as well about this idea of revolution, because I know when we set the challenge in our last issue, we, we were thinking quite broadly about revolution as well, and obviously most of the films, uh, clips we showed were sort of political militant revolution, but I also tried to include more personal revolutions in there, film victim and things, and, you know, for, which for me, you know, um, would have been seen quite revolutionary at that time to have made a film like that, for example, so I just wonder, can we use this term revolution loosely in terms of, can it be more personal, can it be, and also maybe something like in America the Tea Party movement, could that be considered a revolution? I mean, is it, does it, do the goals, but why not, and for what reason, maybe it's a leave it. Um, I, guess, I, I guess for me what I wanted to say, and sort of like to add into what I've just said, I mean, I'm, I'm not really into politics or science and stuff, I'm more involved in human rights, but I'm, I'm really interested in terms of how people really view in revolution and not being sort of like political, you know, when we're occupying. But I think what I was just say, when you say that if you're not seeking change, I guess for me, it's like if you're not seeking change, then what is the purpose of it? If there's going to be a difference, but that's that would be the question. That would be but I think in terms of, you know, of how you're going to take it next, I mean, I'm African, I was born in Africa, and I think for me, revolution, you know, when you, when you leave the occupation, for me, you know, it's about what is happening within, and it yeah. starts from within. Mm -hmm. So when people leave that occupation and they go back into the community, mm -hmm. how are they going to be treating their neighbor? Yeah. Where are they going to be shopping? Where are they going to be taking in five clothes? Where are they going to be sending mm -hmm. their children to school? Mm -hmm. You know, sort of thing. And how are they going to be involved in, in the good movement? That's sort of thing. And for me, that is revelation. It has to start from your home. They are from within and how you treat mm -hmm. the next person next to you, sort of thing. Because otherwise, there's no point to go to an occupation and be having really love and really to treat everyone. So again, I really love them, it's fantastic. And, it, and I think it's really incredible that you do support it. Mm -hmm. But however, I think the most important thing is for us to, to carry it forward. Yeah. And then go back into the community and actually make a difference in something from the grassroots. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think certainly in terms of your point on change, mm -hmm. is that to say, I view change as sort of tinkering. Little, little changes, and then there's, there's something more fundamental that can happen um, when you get, you know, uh, you know, a transformation in cultural consciousness, like a big shift in terms of the way people view the world themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, I think, is, is back to, to your point about people actually you know, It's like almost the least political space I've ever been in, in some, some ways, mm -hmm. the Occupy, because actually people were going, in terms of internal change, just giving my own experience, I arrived on camp. I'm, when I'm off camp, I live quite a nice middle class life. I live in a nice house, you know, I don't really tend to deal with many homeless people or people who are addicted to drugs or people who are alcoholics, that, that's not part of my world, it's like these issues out like there. And I think, oh, I'm so liberal, you know, and, you know, I, I have no issues with those people or poor them that they've had these difficult lives. And then suddenly I'm in a camp, got no lock on my tent, I've only got a tent, and there are people walking around who are drunk or, you know, high as a kite, and, and I'm now, now I'm responsible for my interaction with um, each of these individual people, and it just, just my own prejudice just flew up right in front of my face, and I was just sort of thinking, oh my god, I'm really prejudiced. Like I've really, you know, sort of started noticing what I was thinking about these people and how I felt unsafe and all this stuff. So I decided just to go around the camp and interview people and ask them what their story was and how how they ended up addicted to alcohol, how they ended up. Um, homeless, what their journey was, what inspired them in life, um, what, why were they at the occupation and what did they see for themselves in that. And, and it was just this like, incredible learning curve for me and it's impacted me enormously and it impacts me in my daily life now at home. And that was one day on camp, I think that's what the camp provides, is it takes you out of your like ordinary context, um, which for a lot of people, even if they might think they're particularly liberal or or whatever, actually the majority of people have pretty kind of homogenous groups that they hang around with, you know, you mm -hmm. hang out with people who think largely the same as we do, who look pretty much the same as we do, who have kind of similar lives. 
and to be in a situation where your world is expanded but at that velocity it's incredibly powerful and then you can take that back to your community and go hang on guys mm -hmm. you know that's how I think about the way we're we're doing things here. I'm, I actually found it a really empowering space being as well massively empowering just the participation um, you know it's not great sleeping in the cold street in the thin tent and you know <laughs> it was pretty. It was, you know, we turned up. We didn't even have a tent. <laughs> we were sleeping bag, We just turned up, but you know, and then it, it, you, it gets accommodated. But it's actually, as I left, I, I didn't really want to leave. You know, when I when I left, I was like, you know, this really feels like there's some amazingly strong community thing going on here, which is not usually in our lives. Well, not in my life anyway. So that in itself, I think, is quite revolutionary. I think there is a kind of worry, though, about the ideas being kind of appropriated for things that maybe we don't want them to be appropriated. Because when I got there, that, you know, you get, when we first got there, it was a night of occupation outside of St. Paul's, and some, I got handed loads of leaflets, and one of them was actually a kind of libertarian one that was actually trying to say, we want the, the occupation and the Tea Party are this very similar, they've got similar kind of aims, and, and it was kind of sort of drawing the attention to both. And I think that sort of, I think there is the side, there is a kind of side of the right that are also saying we don't think the bankers should be failing these people out. And I think there's a certain sense that we want to be also resisting that kind of appropriation. Personally, I think that's one of the sort of distinctions that we really want to push and draw I think that was just in terms of the, the clip I used of the life of Brian. And the reason I use that is because it, for me, these, you know, determines how different people can appropriate words, democracy, freedom, mm -hmm. for their own ends, and then sort of get into sort of almost internal squabbles about, you know, what the, the whole thing means. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered about this, the goal of, of this revolution, or a revolution, how much, the, you know, the, the tenures of it is, how important is that? I mean, you know, you sort of say, no, Tea Party can't be revolutionary, and, and I sort of wondered, what is it that defines a revolution? I think, well, the reason I would say the Tea Party wasn't a revolution, and, and then I'll probably answer my own question by, by going on the negative first, is that I don't think it's a revolutionary idea to punish the weakest people in society. It's kind of as old as the hills. There's nothing revolutionary about that concept of saying, "Oh no, we're, we've hit a sticky wicket. It must be those funny-looking people down the road." That but it's the idea of equality and, and what what this movement is is standing for. Isn't that as old as the hills too, or is that quite a new idea? Um, I think the idea is on the hills. The implementation of it is not. And in ter in terms of the social kind of contemporary social context of where we're at. Equality is absolutely a revolutionary idea. I and mean, even if you, I've just had little conversations with people about the idea of a world that was equal, and you see the response when you start talking to people about it. You know, people go, but, but we're not equal. You know, you know the, the classic case. You know, well, how will you get these people to be doctors if everyone's paid the same, whether they're a doctor or a street? You know, these kind of sort of redundant arguments. But I think what they, what they cover up is is a kind of a social context which is we're not equal, we're different and some people are worth more than other people and to, to voice up any idea that falls outside of that context is, is, is a revolutionary act and the Tea Party is completely consistent with that social context, there's nothing new. I mean the Tea Party at best you could say, and I actually think you can't even say this, but at best you could probably say that they're a rea they're reactionary revolution yeah. in a sense. Um, but I think you can't even, I mean, if you look at the, the actual sort of social makeup of the movement and the um, its sort of modes of, modes of funding and organisation and everything else, it's clearly not very To establish? Um, well, I mean, if you just look at, the, look at the people that are funding it, I mean, they're sort of massive, uh, you know, American oligarchs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of get this feeling that the, occu the, the occupation movement will stop being revolutionary the minute they get something to hand, and the minute they kind of get a set of ideas that they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's something about the, the unknowing and the openness of having a question, yeah. which in itself is quite revolutionary because we we always want answers and you know we get told this is this, this is how this is and but actually in terms of a state of being, to be in a state of questioning is a more revolutionary, it's more it's more yeah. alive state than it is to think you've got all the answers and you know exactly how the world should be. But, but <coughs> At the same time, I, I think the idea that you mentioned at the beginning that there is no specific political demand, but it is more about being together in a way um, triggers again one of the two sides of May 68, which tends to be then the reference often with contemporary political discourses. And the, the, 
so the two sides of May 68 would be one of a specific political demand, another of a sort of euphoria <coughs> of being there, of being there together. Um, and you find this kind of analysis in, in, in many people, which um, at times does recall the being together of other music festivals or something like that. And then why you say that there is this euphoria and this kind of being there together is, is in itself what is revolutionary at the same time that you sort of um, evolve the idea of equality which is one that definitely does need a political formulation otherwise we tend to be all pretty much in the same in the same protest the Tea Party or, or any other form of political agitation um, there is a sense that the kind of suspicion towards um, political articulation or the, the, the attempt to articulate a number of aims, goals, or political ideas, at least temporarily draft something like a political strategy. Uh, it's overwhelmed by the euphoria of being together that tends to then dissipate um, any possibility of articulating something once the euphoria is over. Something like that. So, in a way, that being there together is definitely important, uh, but the suspicion then that having to articulate a political idea in a more specific way, or that that would be bad, um, undermines the very idea of being there together. I don't think the um, the expression of a political idea is bad. That that's certainly not my view, um, but it's that the race to a political idea is unnecessary. Mm. So it's a more nuanced argument, is that actually you have time, you know, we're not trying to win an election next year, we're not following, you know, the media cycle. There's no reason actually to kind of go, well, well we must keep the attention of the media so we you know we must get to this political idea. Um, like you said, it's, it's that people are actually, they're questioning themselves, their worldviews, you know, all of these things are going on, and that is so important that actually that process, however long that takes, it takes. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, there may well be a coherent political idea. There may not, it may dissolve and people go back to their lives. But I think the very process is, is critical because it's what we don't do, you know, it's, it's we regurgitate political ideas that other people have come up with and, and, and actually, you know, to have the opportunity in a space with, with a diverse group of people to just question and question and question is fantastic. Good. And whatever comes out at the end, great. I don't understand why the, the formulation of a political argument would be an attempt to change the media, the attention of the media. No, the attempt to rush end. to it is, is what I'm talking about. I'm just saying I don't have any issue with a political idea at all coming out of it, but my point that I made that you responded to, I was clarifying that point to say that I don't have an issue with a political idea coming out, but I do have an issue with a rush to to come to some political conclusion or position, like now, because it's really, really urgent. Isn't it urgent? No, it's important and it's different. I mean, I think that the, the question for this, for this rush for something uh, um, contingent or you know a political uh, I ideology or idea to put forward I think that in response to that I think that I'm kind of more like posing the problem as opposed to I'm in complete support of Occupy London myself and yeah. but this idea that you mentioned we and so my problem that I'm posing and this is then bringing it, bringing it back to cinema to theatre mm -hmm. to Occupy London like who are we and for whom is this revolutionary film or this revolution for? To, to whom am I speaking to? Mm -hmm. And then the same with cinema. Who is watching? Yeah. Who do I, I'm kind of, I, I do theatre as well as uh, cinema. Mm -hmm. So who comes to see my performance? Who am I tapping into? Mm -hmm. Who am I trying to speak to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just referring back to this problem of the we, that it's already, that it's become perhaps the, uh, I wouldn't say, you know, it, I mean, because as you say, everyone's welcome, but there's almost now that there's a group that is made, and perhaps the whole thing with revolutions is its instability, perhaps, 
is this constant instability that, that drives you forward mm-hmm. for the now, that this has to be now, that change has to be now, because it's not just for we, but we as a nation. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem for me is this, this revolution for me absolutely involves the masses. Mm-hmm. And I mean, my family are from a working class background and, you know, uh, we're very much part of the new generation, as it were, but, yeah. but who are we speaking to now? And, and this is the problem. And, and, and for, for this um, clip of Charlie Chaplin, mm-hmm. I love this film. It's right. really something beautiful. But this, um, the, the tramp who accidentally falls upon communism and accidentally picks up the flag and accidentally leads the revolution, mm-hmm. and then in the end walks away to his everyday life, you know, having perhaps changed somewhat. So really, it's just posing this problematic to who, to whom are we trying to tap into? And then this comes back to you with kind of human rights and kind of. Uh, tapping into communities perhaps. So how do we begin to assimilate communities? As much as my film may be revolutionary, who watches it? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's more of a problem posed. It's a good, good question. And actually it might be interesting to lead into the films we're gonna watch now. Three films that were made that we've chosen to show. One of them is an American film made about the Occupy Wall Street protests. One is um, made by Sky, which is about London. Uh, okay. Occupy London. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry, okay, sorry. Um, and one is made by Bradley from One Plus One, so we'll show those and then we'll go into a bit more debate about those afterwards. Okay?